Now Jesus, I said, for I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the night. Got it.
Good morning and happy Sunday church. It is so great that you're joining us wherever you may be watching from. Perhaps you're joining us from Hong Kong or anywhere else in the world. We welcome you warmly. Hey, maybe this is also the first time you've ever joined us and we love to be able to welcome you. Make sure you check out our website and just see the resources that we have available for you. Also, if you need prayer for any area of your life, if you want to join one of our connect groups, if you even want to sign up for our daily devotion, we warmly welcome you to do that. You're going to love to Today's service is going to encourage you, it's going to bless you. God bless you today. It's going to be a great Sunday. Sleep. 
Amen. What a beautiful time of worship. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Amen. You know, one of my favorite scriptures that I just want to encourage you with this morning is Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. This is the Lord speaking. And he says to you, fear not, for I am with you. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged because I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. You know, it is so easy for us to believe that God is right there with us when we're on the mountaintop, when we're having those mountaintop experiences or those seasons where we feel like everything is going well, sun is shining on us, birds are chirping, we're in a scene from a Disney movie, everything is going well. But what about those moments and those times when you're right there in the valley? Where do you feel God is? Where is He there with you in those moments as well? Let me reassure you, yes, he is. He's promised to never leave you and never forsake you. And right now, you know, that's how you may be feeling. You may be in that valley of marital distress or perhaps financial issues or even health issues. Church, let me encourage you. God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has promised that He is your God. Amen. That He will help you through whatever issues you are going through. He will see you through through to the other side. Amen. And at the cross, you know, Jesus was forsaken for us so that we would never be forsaken by God. You are never alone. And that's why I love partaking of Holy Communion every single day, because it reminds me, it brings to my remembrance that my God is for me, that my God will never leave me, that my God will help me through whatever issues I'm going through. He will uphold me with his righteous right hand. You know that right hand? That is a sign, that is a, a symbol of his strength, of his victory, of being overcomers in life. Amen. And it's not through our love for him that we overcome. It is because of his love for us. Amen. So right now, I want you to take the bread. I want you to hold it high. Let's remember all that Jesus did for us upon the cross. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body, broken so that ours could be made whole. We thank you, Lord, that we are loved, we are favoured, we are blessed beyond measure, Lord. And I thank you that as we partake of this bread, we are reminded that as we eat of it, Lord, we partake of your life, your Zoe life, Lord, flowing into every part of our body. We are growing younger and younger, stronger and stronger, healthier and healthier. Every part of our bodies, Lord, is imbued with your health, your wellness, and your goodness in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, church, let's partake together. And I want you to hold that cup as well, the beautiful, precious, powerful blood of Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we thank you for your blood, your blood that was shed for us, Lord. Your blood declares us righteous and holy. We thank you, Lord, for your blood. It protects us. It breaks every curse over our life, Lord. And I thank you, Jesus, right here and now, that before our Heavenly Father, we are cleansed, we are righteous and made holy in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's partake together. Church, just close your eyes right now. Let me just pray for you. Father, we thank you for your great love. Our Holy Spirit, remind us every day how loved we are and that you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are right there with us, always whispering to us how loved, how blessed and favoured we are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you, church.
amazing love that welcomes me the kindness of mercy that poured with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving so good God you're so good oh God you're so good you're so good to me behold the cross
Church, so good to be with you today. Let me just encourage you when it comes to receiving the Lord's supply into your life. Amen. Look what it says in Isaiah 54 verse 2. It says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. This scripture, it's all about Israel and how God would bring his covenant with Abraham to pass. Literally, God stretched Israel through Christ and created a kingdom family. It's called the church. That's you and I right throughout the world. Amen. But look at this word stretch. Like a rubber band, your capacity and what you think you can do, it's so much greater. A rubber band, it is small, insignificant, but it exists to be stretched. That's its purpose. And at times you might think you're small. You might think you're insignificant. But God, he sees you so much bigger. All he needs to do is just stretch you. How does God stretch you? It's through faith. Amen. It's through you believing and trusting in God's word. It says, my God shall supply all your need as you simply just believe the word of God. You're being stretched. Amen. Your faith is being stretched and you'll see that provision and supply of God coming into your life. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Once again, as you just simply believe the word of God, your faith is being stretched and you'll see supply and provision coming into your life. Maybe at times that stretch, it's pretty hard to believe because there are circumstances and difficulty in your life. At times it might even hurt. And you know, when I'm physically stretching, I, I, I hate it. It's one of the most painful things, whether it's before or after exercise. But my personal trainer, he says it's good for me. My physician says it's good for me. My wife says it's good for me. And as you just begin to step out in faith and you stretch when it comes to things like your giving, you'll see the supply of the Lord just effortlessly flowing into your life because God responds to faith. Amen. He loves it when you step out in faith. Faith is hearing. It's declaring and acting upon his word. You can be hearing God's word and that is good. Amen. You can be declaring God's word. That is good. But you also need to be acting on that word. Amen. That's what we call faith. At first, it might be a stretch to give. It might hurt. It might be hard. But as you just let God stretch you, look what he does for you. In 2 Corinthians 9, 10 and 11, he says, Now he who supplies. Can you see that? The Lord your God, he's the one who does all the supplying for you. He supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. He will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. He goes on to say in verse 11, you will be enriched in every way, not just financially, in all these different other areas of your life so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Amen, church. As you just allow the Lord your God to stretch you, just trust Him, believe Him, and you'll see supply, provision, health, the goodness of God, whatever it is, just coming into your life. Amen. Let me just pray for you. Dear Lord God, I thank you for every single member of our church. I thank you for every single household, every person, Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that you're a good God. You're, you're a precious God who cares about us. And I thank you, Lord, that as we just step out and we allow you to stretch us, how? Just by trusting and believing in your name, by trusting and believing in your word, we'll see all your supply, all your provision, and all your goodness coming into our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming up, stay tuned for Pastor Wayne's powerful series, The Seed. 接落嚟，请你享受有维恩牧师分享精彩嘅讲道系列《种子》。Hi Church, so good to be with you once again. Hey, we've been doing a special series. It's called The Seed, and、uh, I know I said it was just a two-week series, but I listened to a message on faith. In fact, during the week, it was by one of the lecturers of Caris Bible College. And it really inspired me. It reminded me of something that Jesus said about a mustard seed of faith. So just like that, we have week three, the seed. Do you know many believers? They become discouraged because they think they do not have enough faith, or their faith is too small. 
And if you really understood what the word actually says about the faith you possess as a believer, that it's a supernatural faith, that it's the faith of God, you never get discouraged thinking that your faith is too small. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Mark eleven twenty two 22 says, have faith in God. Now, this is what we call a Hebrewism. It's a little bit like when people here in Hong Kong encourage one another by saying, add oil. Now, the Yaman sometimes in the office will say, Pastor Wayne, add oil. But what Jesus is doing here is he's using a Hebrew phrase, a Jewish phrase to his disciples. And what he's actually saying is, have the God kind of faith. Now, you cannot possess this God kind of faith through yourself, just like you cannot produce the righteousness of God through yourself. Righteousness, the righteousness of God, it is a gift. And the God kind of faith, it is also a gift. Now, I'll come back to that thought a little later. Now, Jesus, he shares a parable about the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed. But today, I want to talk to you about a mustard seed of faith. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, nothing would be impossible for you. Maybe you're unfamiliar with mustard seeds. Well, if you think of a sesame seed bun, the mustard seeds, they're so much smaller. And what Jesus is saying is you don't need big faith to actually get a miracle. Amen. In fact, to use the terminology like big faith or my faith is too small, it's actually erroneous. It misunderstands something very important about your faith. Now, I didn't see this that clearly until I listened to that message from Karis Bible College. It was by Andrew Womack. But let's go to the passage that I'm referring to, first of all, and we'll read it. It's in Matthew 17, 20. Jesus, he's opening by answering a question, and then he elaborates. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for truly I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. On the surface, it sounds like Jesus is saying, hey, boys, if you can just grow your faith, even if it's just a little tiny mustard seed of faith, nothing will be impossible for you. But that's not what he's saying to them. He's not telling them to grow their faith. He says, have faith. What they need is a supernatural faith. And this supernatural faith, it cannot be produced by you. It can only be supplied by Jesus. Do you know the faith needed to become born again is a supernatural faith? You cannot be born again with a natural human faith. You need God to impart a supernatural faith unto you. And that's what happened when you were born again. Think about that. Well, think about what you believed at the point of salvation. You are believing in a God you cannot see. You're believing in his son, Jesus, that he went to the cross for you, who you cannot see. You believe that he paid the price for all of your sins, which you can't really see. You are believing that all your sin went onto Jesus at the cross, which you did not see. And then you're believing that you received a recreated spirit. It's what we call a born again spirit. Once again, you can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't touch it. And you believe that the Holy Spirit of God now lives within you. And you can't see him. You can't feel him. You can't touch him. Now, you might be able to sense and even feel his anointing, but not the spirit. Now, that's a lot of believing for something that we cannot see. But we believe it, don't we? It's amazing. Why? It's because we all receive a supernatural impartation of faith from God to believe. You can't believe all that stuff with your natural human faith. You don't use natural human faith to be born again. You use God faith to be born again. It's a supernatural faith that comes from Jesus himself as you hear the word of God. Amen. Scripture, it actually takes it one step further. It says it is the faith of Christ. I'll show you this in scripture. It's going to surprise you. But first of all, I want to open from Romans chapter 4. In Romans 4, verse 17 to 19, it says, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. It's talking about Abraham. In fact, he was Abraham, which means father, but God changed his name to Abraham 
a father of many nations. Now, this verse, it reveals something about this supernatural faith of God. God calls those things which be not as though they are. Abraham, he was childless, yet God called him a father of many nations. Abraham. You see, this supernatural faith of God, it doesn't go by the natural. It doesn't go by what you can see in the physical. It doesn't go by unfavorable circumstances. It goes by what the word of God says, by what God's word says. God declared something about Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. Supernatural faith, it declares the same thing, amen. You know, people who criticize the word of faith, they're, they're claiming we are just blab and grab. We're, we're blabbing something and then trying to grab it. Whatever we declare, then God must manifest it as though we are forcing God to do it. But that's not what the word of faith is. The word of faith, it only declares what God's word has already declared, amen. The word of faith just agrees and believes what God's word says healing or health, it has been purchased and declared through Christ's atonement. So we declare it in faith. Scripture says, my God shall supply all my need. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. In 3 John 2, beloved, I wish and pray above all things that you will be in health and prosper. You see, prosperity, provision, it is already established in the word of God. So we agree with it and we declare it. That's what the word of faith is. Amen. And let's read on in verse 18. It says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. It says, so shall thy seed be. The Greek word for seed here is sperma. Just like the mustard seed became a tree, Abraham's seed became many nations. Amen. Note, it's in accordance with what was spoken. The faith in the word of God is activated when it is spoken. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Doesn't matter how unfavorable they might be or, un or, or how unfavorable the situation is or how hopeless it might be. Abraham, he believed and he agreed with God, even though the circumstances were completely against what God said. You see, supernatural faith, it does not go by natural circumstances. It goes by the word of God. It goes on to say in verse 19, and being not weak in faith, say weak. Excellent. He considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. It says not being weak in faith. See, it's not about having big faith or little faith. Jesus just said faith as a grain of mustard seed can move mountains. You see, it's not about big faith. It's the faith you possess isn't weak or strong. Weak does not mean small or little. Strong does not necessarily mean big. You see, Abraham was not weak in faith. In other words, he had strong faith. And I'm going to show how all of you can walk in this strong supernatural faith just like Abraham. Amen. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and what it says about this supernatural faith. It says, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This is a well-known scripture, and it says you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. The word that, it can be interpreted in two ways. That salvation is not of yourself, and that's correct. That faith you need to get saved is not of yourself. And that is also correct because the faith you need for salvation, it's not a natural human faith. It's a supernatural faith that comes through the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes. It's talking about this supernatural faith by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Supernatural faith does not come through yourself or through you deciding, well, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. It comes through the word of God. 1 Peter 1, says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, that is something that comes from you, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Everything about salvation, it comes from God. Even the faith to be saved 
comes from God. It comes through the incorruptible seed of God's word. When you get born again, it's not through a natural human faith. It's the supernatural faith of God that you receive as a gift. Amen. So can you see, can you begin to see it's erroneous to say, I have no faith or it's too small because your faith, it comes from God. And that faith that created the universe and everything in this world, it's on the inside of you. But not only do you have a faith that comes from God, it is the faith of Christ himself. Look at this in Galatians 2 verse 16. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Now, keep that scripture up on the screen. Can you see it says we are justified by the faith of Jesus? It does not say by faith in Jesus. Now, this is what the original Greek text states. And there are modern translations today, like the NIV, the Nearly inspired version, <laughs> which have replaced this faith in Christ. You see, it was just too hard for some of those translators to be able to accept that we receive the faith of Christ. Now, I, can, I know this could be messing with your brain, and uh, it would have messed with my brain a few years back, but until I discovered that, that I am in Christ Jesus, as he is, so am I in this world, and I've received the gift of his righteousness. I don't find this all that difficult to believe or accept. Now, let's drop down to verse 20. Look what it also says. In Galatians 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Just like we receive Jesus' righteousness as a gift, we also receive Jesus' faith as a gift. So your faith in Christ, it is the faith of Christ. Now let that sink in your mind. Let it mess with your brain just for a little bit. But you see, it does make sense because natural human faith, it will never cut it. Just like natural human self-righteousness doesn't cut it. Amen? Natural human faith, it's dependent upon your senses, your feelings, even your experiences. It leans on your own talents and your own, your own giftings and what you think you can do for yourself. There's nothing wrong with natural talents and giftings, but when they are anointed by God through his Holy Spirit, that's when he can use them. Even Jesus, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit during his earthly ministry, his earthly life. But supernatural faith, it is the God kind of faith. It comes from God. Now, look at this. Here is something else that you might not have known. You know, faith, this supernatural faith of God, it's also a fruit of the Spirit. I know your mind might be a little rattled right now, but let's look at Galatians 5, It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, keep that scripture up on the screen again. The word faith there in verse 22, it is faith, not faithfulness, as many translations record. Faith in the Greek is pistis. Now, faithfulness is pistos. Now, it's no wonder different translations have gone either way, some recording it faithfulness and others recording it faith because the words are so similar. Now, I read so many commentaries on different views and opinions about whether it's faith or faithfulness. It seems like everyone has their own view. I just got so tired of listening to everyone else's view. So I'm going with whatever the original text states. If it says pistis, which is faith, well, that's what I'm going with. So the faith is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the scripture that really drives home faith as a gift that it's deposited within you, it's in Romans 12, 3. Now, you know Romans 12, 2. But look, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. For I say, through grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. It says the measure 
of faith. The word measure there in the Greek is metron. It means a unit of measure, the required measure. That measure that we've all received is the faith of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.16 tells us that. Galatians 2.20 says that. Even Peter says a very similar thing in 2 Peter 1, verse 1. He says, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Like precious faith, this is what it means. Equal to, of equal value of the same kind. We have the same kind of faith as Peter and Paul and all these great men and women of God. The only difference between your faith and someone else's faith is maybe their mind is renewed to the word of God more than yours. And therefore, they might be using that faith. They might be more conscious of that faith that they have received, and therefore they're using it. It's not about having big faith or little faith. It's not about having more faith or less faith. It's whether you are conscious of the faith that you have received and whether you are using it. Jesus makes this point in Luke 17, verses 5 to 8. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Like so many believers today, you think the issue is my faith is just too small. I need to have more faith. The truth is we have all received the same measure of faith, the same value of faith, the same kind of faith. It is the faith of Christ. It's whether you are using it or not. Now in verse 6, Jesus replies, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Now listen to the parable that Jesus then uses to make this point. Verse 7, he says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now, sit down and eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Jesus is saying here in the same way, if you have a servant, you will use that servant and you will put that servant to work. Faith needs to be used. Faith needs to be put to work. James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. Now, this is not works of the law. It's not the works of the flesh. It is the work of faith. Amen. It's the actions that align with your faith. It's believing God's word. It's calling those things which be not as though they are. Amen. Like God did with Abraham. You might not be seeing it in the natural yet, but God, he's already declared it about you. So use your faith like Abraham. Agree with what God says. Declare what God says and you will see it. This is why some believers seem to have stronger faith than others. Some are just using their faith, whilst others, they might be operating more out of their flesh or their feelings. When you are faith conscious, which comes from feeding on the word, and there's an overflow of the word in you, you'll use your faith. But if you're feeling or flesh conscious, which means there's a, there's a deficiency of the word, you'll have a tendency not to use your faith. The truth for most believers, we don't have a faith problem. We have a knowledge problem. For many of us, we don't know what we already got. Yeah. Now, when I first understood this, when I saw in the parables of Jesus and how he's teaching on the, the laws of the kingdom of God and how it operates and how it functions, how faith operates and functions, it changed many things in my life, starting with the way I pray. I stopped pleading and entreating God, especially for things that had already been promised in the word of God. I just started to declare them. I agreed with what the word of God says, and I declare them. Amen. I acknowledge what belongs to me as a son, and I proclaim it in faith, what belongs to me. Amen. These laws of the kingdom of God, they work just like natural laws in the physical. You know, I should actually say that the other way around. The natural laws in this physical world operate like the spiritual laws in the kingdom because those laws, they came first. But think of gravity. It always works. If I have something and I drop it on earth, it is always going to fall. Gravity is a law and it always works on earth. Think of other laws like the laws of physics and the laws of maths 
they always work. In fact, they are universal. Electricity, the laws of electricity, they're a great illustration in the natural to how the laws of faith operate in the spiritual. You see, electricity, it always flows through a conductor like copper wires and uh, electricity. It will not flow through things like rubber or wood because they're not good conductors. Likewise, faith, it flows through certain environments, but not in others. Faith will not operate in an environment of doubt and unbelief. They're like rubber or wood to faith. Faith operates in hope through belief. Amen. Now, God, he does not violate his natural or his supernatural laws. Notice how gravity always works. Drop something, it will always drop. Physics and math formulas, they always work. Likewise, the laws of faith, they will always work. You don't have to be a special person to make them work. Anyone can operate them. You just need to know them. So to close out this message, let me give you some of the key laws of faith. And there are many. And I'm going to preach these out of that great story, the woman who had the 12-year affliction, you know, the 12-year issue of blood. It illustrates so many of the laws of faith, illustrates them so well. So it's in Mark chapter 5. Let's start reading from verse 25. It says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. Now this is a picture of hopelessness the absolute depravity of man without God. We might all be able to relate to this woman right now. Look what COVID-19, that pandemic, has done right around the world today. And the, it's like this sense of hopelessness in the world today because everyone is in lockdowns and we can't do this and we can't do that. It's a good story to meditate on right now because you cannot put your trust in man. You cannot even put your trust in yourself. This story, it reveals the only real hope to humanity is God himself. Amen. Now, the Holy Spirit, he wants you to see that Jesus is your healer. And as you hear the good news about Jesus, amen. And it says in verse 27, when this woman, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes. I shall be made well. She, it says, when she heard about Jesus. Heard what? Well, that Jesus was healing people. He was healing blind people and deaf people and lame people, people with leprosy. He was healing all kinds of people. Now, when she heard this, she didn't become cynical. She didn't become skeptical. She didn't start Googling, let me find out what others are thinking about Jesus. No, she just believed. She accepted it. She declared, I shall be made whole. Now, in verse 29, it says, immediately, immediately, like when you flick on a light switch and immediately it comes on, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, once again, there's that word immediately, like when you know the power is flowing, immediately knowing in himself power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now, Jesus, he literally felt power flow out of him. And what follows is Jesus' disciples saying, well, Jesus, there's many people around you. Many people are pressing you and touching against you. Anyone could have touched you. But Jesus, he keeps inquiring, who touched me? And this woman, she finally owns up. It was me. And then he says to her in verse 34, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So let me give you some laws of faith. I want to give you four laws that will cause this power of God to flow. Amen. Now just remember the illustration or the metaphor I gave you about electricity. Electricity, it has a power source. It comes from a generator. It has this transmission grid these power plants, substations that store the power. And then in your home, there are conductors and outlets that use the power. The laws of faith, they're very similar. First of all, the power source is the word of God. 
The word is what initiates faith in you. It says in verse 27, when she heard about Jesus. Oh, pastor, I know that. You've preached that several times before. I've heard it before. I thought you were going to tell me something new, something interesting. Well, if you know this, is it working for you? You see, the problem with many believers is they're always chasing after something new instead of focusing on understanding what they already have, what they've already heard. God's word is the source of supernatural faith. John 6.63 says that Jesus' word is spirit and life, supernatural faith. It comes through preaching. It's through hearing and reading and studying and meditating, but it's the word of God. That's what the key is. Amen. Romans 10, 17 says, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This woman, she heard the message that Jesus heals. And when you hear that Jesus heals, it will produce faith, the healing. When you hear that Jesus provides and he prospers and he delivers, it will produce faith to you in those areas. It's not the power of positive thinking. It's not a motivational message. It's the word of God. Faith flows when you are connected into the actual power source, and that is the word of God. If your faith seems weak, see the word of God like a charger. Sit down, read it, meditate, soak in the word of God, and be recharged in your faith. Amen. Number two, the power plan is the heart of belief. Your heart, it either holds on to or it hinders faith. Remember the, 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 the parable of the, the, the sower that Jesus talked about? He talked about different types of hearts that hold on to the word and others that don't. You see, belief, it resides in the heart. And in Mark 5, 28, let me read this to you from the New Living Translation. It says, for she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Your inner thoughts, your innermost thoughts, they reveal what you believe in your heart. Ultimately, your belief is seen through your actions. And it says, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. See, some of the simplest ways to determine, is the word that I'm hearing becoming faith in me? Just look at your actions. You know, in the face of problems, what do you do? Do you pray? Do you go to the word of God? And so is, is it this faith type thing that you're doing? Or do you respond out of your flesh or your feelings? If there is a lack of provision or even prosperity, do, do you see Jesus as your shepherd? Do you see him as the one that's going to provide for you? And when you do, you'll have no problems about giving and tithing. But when, when you don't, that you'll, you'll struggle when it comes to those areas in your life. You see, this woman, she acted on her belief. She reached out and she touched Jesus. Peter, he stepped out of the boat. David, he stood and he faced Goliath. Abraham, he took Isaac up to the mountaintop. Isaac, he sowed in a time of famine. Noah, he built the ark. Moses, he sprinkled blood on the doorpost. Joshua, he marched around those walls of Jericho. Gideon, he fights the enemy with just 300 men. All of them, they acted on what they heard. They acted on what they believed. So when you believe something, you'll act. When Peter stepped out of the boat, he, he didn't have time to think. He just stepped out. When you start overthinking and overanalyzing things, that's when faith can be lost because you go back to yourself instead of responding out of the spirit. I remember as a young man in my early 20s, I went on a missions trip with uh, a pastor and we went into Timor, and in, in this meeting, the pastor, he, he, was, he, had, he received all these words of knowledge uh, about people who had sicknesses and problems with them, and, and, and one of them was this young boy. He was only 13 years old, and he said, there's a boy here who can't walk. And so out comes this boy, and he's got these crutches, and his name was Frankie. In fact, he was born crippled. And he had been on crutches all of his life. And he looked at that boy and he said, in the name of Jesus, you are going to be healed of this problem today. And then he said, Wayne is going to put his hand upon you and you'll be healed. And on the inside, I thought, am I? But you see, I had no time to think. 
I just walked over and put my hand upon him and said, in Jesus' name, and guess what? He threw those crutches away and he started running around that church building. Now, if I had time to think about it, I can tell you this, my faith would have gone. And sometimes with faith, you just step out. You know, that same meeting, he, he said there was a blind man in this room and, and out comes this blind man. And it was a man who was in the legislative council. So he was a very high standing. Then my pastor said the same thing. Wayne's going to put his hands upon your eyes and they're going to open. And so I, I'd learned by now, just do what I'm told to do. And I put my hands upon those eyes and they opened and those blind eyes started seeing. Once again, I, I, I didn't have time to think. You see, if you do start overthinking and overanalyzing, you'll probably lose that faith. Faith acts, amen, on what you believe in your heart. Number three, you are a conductor of faith when you speak the word. At home, you have all these light switches, and you just turn on all your lights with a flick of the switch, don't you? But you have all this wiring that, that is connected to those lights, and that's how the electricity travels across all of those wirings. They are copper wires. They are conductors. Now, your voice, your words, they are the conductors of faith. The faith in your heart, it travels through the declaration of your word. Amen. It says in verse 28, for she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, she didn't just say this once. The, the, the Greek implies that she kept saying this to herself over and over. It's like she's literally convincing herself. And that's, that's a great little illustration for faith. Just keep telling yourself over and over, convince yourself because it is truth. And sometimes there is doubt on the inside of you. So when you start declaring it and saying it to yourself over and over, faith is rising on the inside of you. She didn't talk herself out of it. She talked herself into it. And this is the definition of meditation. When you just take a scripture and you begin to dwell and meditate upon that scripture over and over. If you have a need in your life right now, I, can, I encourage you, Find the scripture that is the answer, God's answer to that need, and just start meditating upon it. Start reading it over and over. Dwell upon it over and over. Start declaring it, saying it over and over. I don't know any other way, any better way to get the word of God rooted within you and to uproot unbelief in the heart. You know, the, the Roman centurion said to Jesus, only speak the word and my servant shall be healed. Romans 10, 8 says, but what saith it? The word is nigh, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. See, it comes out of the mouth, my friend. 1 Corinthians 4, 13 says, we have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written. I believed, and therefore I have spoken. We believe, and therefore speak. Faith, it always speaks. Faith is never silent. Amen. The natural response of the heart when you believe God's word is you will speak it forth. Faith flows when you switch it on through declaring the word. Now, I know I might be going a little over time in this message, but I want to just give you one more law here. Now, this law is not actually in the story, although it did come to me when I was meditating upon this passage. So the fourth law is forgiveness is also a conductor. Just like rubber and wood blocks electricity, unforgiveness, it will block faith. So much medical research today tells us about unforgiveness uh, through suppressed anger, that it can cause so many health issues, cancer, organ failure, skin diseases. And I couldn't help but wonder what caused this issue in this woman's life, in the story. Now, the Holy Spirit didn't reveal its cause, but Jesus did say in verse 34, go in peace and be healed of your affliction. There is no peace when you carry unforgiveness in the heart. Now, I remember when the disciples, they asked Jesus, Lord Jesus, increase our faith. Remember back in Luke 17, verse 5, guess what the issue was? It was to do with forgiveness. Look, 
In verse 4, it says, if your brother trespasses against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day says, I repent, you shall forgive him. The disciples, they'd seen Jesus do so many things, walk on water and heal sick people and raise dead bodies back to life. But this is when they say, increase our faith to do with this issue of forgiveness. You know, forgiving people, it can be tough. It can be even harder than receiving a miracle. But immediately after Jesus talks about forgiveness, that's when he starts talking about faith. Now, it's not a coincidence. I believe the Holy Spirit is revealing the relationship between forgiveness and faith. Unforgiveness is a poor conductor of faith. It will block your faith. Become the kind of person that does not hold on to offenses. Amen. In closing, you know, the, the church, when I was a young man, the, the church that I met, Pastor Marion, our pastor, his name was Pastor Cole Stringer. We are still very good friends with him today. He would always close the service with a song about Ephesians 4, 32. And it really built this scripture deep on the inside of us. Verse 32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You see, faith, it flows rapidly, unhindered through forgiveness. But do you need to forgive anyone in your life today? Is there a loved one, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, maybe from a long time ago? Do it in faith. Sometimes we don't feel like forgiving people. Do it in faith. As you just forgive them in faith, the feelings will eventually follow. Amen. I want to pray for you right now, church. So just maybe close your eyes or bow your head. Lord God, I just pray for every single person in our church. Jesus, you said faith as a mustard seed, a mustard seed of faith. It can move mountains. And that's because the faith that we receive it is a supernatural faith. It is the God kind of faith. It is the faith of Christ. As we feed upon the word of God, we don't grow in a natural human faith. It is the supernatural faith of God that we receive. Our faith gets stronger as we just feed upon the word of God. As we speak forth the word of God, we're putting our faith to use. And Lord God, I pray for people right now in C3 Church that they have this revelation, first of all, that they have received the faith of Christ. They have this supernatural faith. They received it when they were born again. It is there. And Lord, as they just grow in the revelation that they have this faith, they'll begin to open their mouth and they'll begin to use it. Just like Peter stepped out and he walked on water, and just like many of the great men and women of faith stepped out and did some great things because they were just acting and believing on the Word of God. I see the, the people of C3 Church just being people of faith. They just agree with the Word of God. They believe the Word of God, and they step out. They declare it, and they step out. I also pray for people, Lord God, who, who, who could be offended right now. And we're, we're, from whatever the source of that offense is, whether it's in their home, a, a, a friendship, a workplace, or something from the past, Lord, maybe it's an offense that has even come through the church. Lord, I pray for these people right now that, Lord, they, they will just release those people. They will forgive those people. They will let go of the offense so their faith can just flow effortlessly, unconsciously through them. Lord, I pray for all these people right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Just keep your heads bowed. Keep your eyes closed. You know, I want to pray for people who maybe you haven't received the forgiveness of God in your life. You know, the one thing about God and what he has done for you is he has canceled all your sin. He's already did it. He did it when Jesus went to the cross. There's a bit of a movement right now around the world where people are canceling people. If they don't agree with something, they cancel them. You know, God's not about that, but you know what he does, what he has done? He has canceled all your sin. He did it when his son went to the cross. And that's the greatest thing that God can do for you. Because when your sin is canceled, he can now fill you with that sense of forgiveness and the gift of his righteousness. And it all comes through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Through the blood of Jesus, we are fully, completely forever forgiven. 
And also through the blood of Jesus, we receive the gift of righteousness. And when we receive Christ into our life, we receive his faith. Amen. And uh, so you can receive all this, this forgiveness, this faith, this righteousness, just by believing upon his name, just by praying this simple prayer. So as we're right now, as we're just praying, if, if you want to accept Jesus, if you want to invite him into your life, I want you to repeat these words after me. Just pray them from your heart. Dear Lord God, I thank you for Jesus. He went to the cross on my behalf. He was punished in my place. He paid the penalty of my sin. He was punished so that I wouldn't be. He was condemned and judged so that I wouldn't be. I thank you that through his blood, I now have the forgiveness of sin. I thank you that through his blood, I am now made righteous. I receive the gift of his righteousness, and I can be called a son of God. Thank you for the faith that I've received from you, Lord God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you. Hey, what an amazing message by Pastor Wayne. What a great injection of faith. Amen. But if you are watching us and perhaps you prayed that prayer for the very first time to invite Christ into your life, you know what? We celebrate with you. We would love for you to be able to contact us and we'd love to give you a small gift. It is a booklet that just explains a little more about the decision that you've made. But church, right now, as we come to a close, why don't you just close your eyes. If you're there with your family, gather gather your children around you. Let me just pray a blessing over you and your household. Amen. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be so gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Father, we thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that every single person watching this broadcast, Lord, I just pray right now for your Holy Spirit just to encourage them, to uplift them, to edify them, Lord, with the great word that we've just heard. I thank you, Lord, for your protection around each and every single person as they go into their week. I thank you, Lord, that our church, they are blessed when they leave their apartments and they are blessed when they come back to those apartments, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that you have made us the head and not the tail. And I finally thank you, Lord, for your peace. Let your peace reign, Lord, in every heart and in every household. In Jesus' name mighty name. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you for watching C3 Church Hong Kong online service. We hope you enjoyed the message and look forward to having you join us next time. God bless. 感謝收看 C3 教會網上直播，希望你享受到今日嘅信息。期待下星期在網上直播見到你。願主祝福你。